Council. The prayer, I'm going to say, incorporates several verses from the Book of Psalms, some of which are read at the season of the Jewish year when we are about to commence our High Holy Days. May God grant you the wisdom and discernment as you gather here today to deliberate, deliberate and decide and to consider with wisdom and equity and justice. May God grant that you ensure the well-being of all the citizens of our city of Salford and to care for those in need of support and protection and to provide continuity and stability in such turbulent and unstable times. May God be your light and salvation and support, support you and grant you courage and the conviction to resolve all the issues before you. We pray for the welfare of our city and we pray that a state of spirit of unity and common purpose shall prevail in your deliberations. We pray for the personal welfare of all the councillors, officers and employees of the city of Salford and their families. And we conclude with the words of King David, may the pleasantness of God be upon us and upon the work of our hands. May God establish the work of our hands upon us. Thank you. Okay, I haven't been informed of any important announcements, um, so can we go straight on to any declarations of interest, pecuniary or personal? Okay. And the minutes of last meeting held then. Could we say that they're a proper and true account of our last meeting? Do we have any apologies for absence for today's meeting? Okay. Can we have a receipt of any petitions or any communications that council has had from the communities. No petitions? It's going to be a quick meeting now. <laughs> I believe we are going to have uh, listening to two uh, motions today. Before that, we've got the um, item six motion to consider amendment. All oh, right. Yeah, is that on there? Right. Oh, sorry. These are colour coded and colour blind. So I believe uh, we have a paperwork that tells us informs us of the different committees for this year. So I'm happy to move the report. I think it's um, a minor amendment in terms of replacing one member on the licensing and safety regulatory panel as per the report. So happy to move the recommendations. Um, thank you. Thank you. As I said earlier, we have two motions today. Uh, the first motion uh, relating to the rail services to Southport, and it's going to be moved by you, Councillor Edwards. Is my microphone working? Yes. Yeah. In 1888, the English Football League was founded, the first Local Government Act was passed, and most importantly, on the 2nd of July 1888, Watchman Station was opened. Shortly after, on the 3rd of August 1888, at 6.20am, the first ever train from Watchman to Southport departed. We've had a service from Watchman to Southport for 131 years. 
In the current timetable, we have two services uh, per hour that go to Southport, and one of those stops at Swinton on the way. However, a new timetable moves both of those services to the Bolton line, meaning, well, we have two and we're losing two, so council, you can do the maths. With the link between Morton and Southport so deep-rooted in our history, trips to Southport are simply part of our town's culture. Ask anyone who's grown up in Morton, Worsley, from Holton or Bruce Town about trips to Southport, you'll be greeted with a warm smile and flooded with happy memories. Day trips to Southport were organised by Wharton Labour Club, Little Holton Labour Club, Little Holton Conservatives Club, St Paul's Church and Wharton British Legion, to name just a few. I'm about to tweet a picture of children of local Labour members from the 15th of August 1941 on their annual outing to Southport at Wharton Station. Happy young faces at Wharton Station waiting for the train to Southport. It's a picture I could have recreated as a young girl with my mum and her friends and their children waiting to go to Southport. This picture could have been recreated thousands of times over the past 131 years. I posted the news about the rerouting of this service to the Bolton line in a group on Facebook about memories for our area. I was absolutely inundated with memories of days out. These date back from those of the organised day trips to some as recent as only last week. One that really struck with me was the story of a daughter of a miner. A dad finished his shift on the local pit, he ran home, he got changed, and every single Saturday for a whole childhood, he'd catch a 12.30 train to Southport. It resonated with me because when it wasn't cricket season, in which case I was at a cricket club with my dad with a packet of quavers and a fruit shoe, we spent Saturdays finding cheap things to do as a day out as a family, going to Southport and Watton Station being one. That story still continues today. Young families use a train to get to Southport because it's cheaper. They told us some don't have a car, so it's their only option. It's far easier to control excited children when you're on a train as opposed to at a steering wheel. And for many families, going to Southport on the train simply adds to the experience. The decision to remove both of our trains to Southport and hand them to another line without any consultation is not just about losing desperately needed transport links. It's more than that. It's a decision that terminates our cultural decisions. A trip to the seaside really isn't too much to ask. Walkden is the nearest station to the RHS Bridgewater, and this decision means cutting off an entire line of stations, and therefore people, from getting the train to visit. It is in the interest of both our local economy and our air quality to maintain and improve rail and bus links to the gardens. This council has put millions of pounds into the RHS, and we have to make it as easy as possible for people to get there. Similarly, a key cultural event in Southport is the Southport Flower Show. Losing this service means we can't fully capitalise on having RHS Gardens in such close proximity to that flower show. The service we've had at Wharton Station in the past two years has been frankly diabolical. Due to strike action, in which I want to say on record that I fully support RMT workers, we've had no Saturday service. On top of this, due to the electrification of Bolton Line, which was extremely delayed and our line didn't benefit at all from, um, we had no Sunday service either. This went on. No weekend service for almost a year. Not only has the Bolton line benefited from electrification at our expense, but they're now benefiting from our services too. I don't need to remind this council that Walton was ignored for accessibility funding. It really does feel like we're being forced into managed decline. In an ideal world, I'd like as much frequency as our line can handle, but all I'm asking in this motion is that you support that one of those services that have been moved to Bolton is moved back to the Wigan line, our line. To conclude, don't retire your buckets and spades yet. In the 1960s, Watton Station came under threat of closure and the people of our town did not let it happen. The importance of this station to our community is something that cannot and will not be underestimated and only a fool will think that they can cross us again. September 2019 should only mark the end of the 2019 school holidays, not the end of a 131 year history of happy holidays for the people of the towns that I'm so proud to be from and so humble to represent. Please, Council, support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Dickman, I believe you're second in this motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to second this motion. And as Councillor Edwards has stated, the Manchester to Southport line has been going to Wharton and Swinton since the stations opened in 1887 and 1888, respectively giving residents the availability of having an easy, direct route through to Southport. When he informed residents of these changes recently, there was a flood of comments from people, both sharing their memories of trips to Southport 
and expressing their disappointment at the process that it's lost. While the route can still be found from Salford Crescent via Bolton, this creates a substantial increase in journey time and the number of changes. Some of the comments mentioned were of grandparents taking their grandchildren to Southport each year, how easy and relaxing it was to go on the train, especially with children, but that the lack of a direct train might make the trip much less appealing. One person recalled their mother taking them on a trip to Southport when they were younger, as it was a safe, safe for them to get the train from right outside their home and go straight to Southport and back again at the end of the day and not have to worry about getting stranded at a station if there was a delay. I'd also be remiss in not recalling my personal favourite comment, which uh, stated that the sooner we renationalise the whole railway system, the better. Um, the cutting of this service is again another example of how Swinton and Watson has been overlooked and residents' ne needs ignored without any consultation with the people. Railway services should not be a luxury. They are an essential form of transport for many people, and the more services that we can offer the best people, the better. For people in Salford, this line provides a direct route to the Salfordian Hotel in Southport, set up to provide affordable home holidays for people over 50, improving well-being and combating loneliness. Loneliness is the, in the elderly is a major concern with many people relying on railway services like this to get out, meet people, and enjoy their lives. Cutting the service is very concerning and could seriously affect the welfare of people in Salford. Let me be clear, this motion is not saying that we want to take the route away from Bolton and those who have lobbied for it. Instead, as the motion states, we want to reinstate a minimum rail service to Southport of one train per hour on the Addison line to be in effect from the May 2020 timetable changes, giving the people of Swinton and Walton the much loved, needed, and direct route to Southport just in time for summer. Thank you. Thank you. We've heard the motion being proposed and the motion being secondary, so can we forward ourselves to a debate on the motion? Councillor Pivot. Uh, yeah, I'm speaking on for this motion. Uh, I live just across the road bridge from Moorside Station, which is often forgotten about in between Swinton and Walton. And this summer, there's been a lot of money spent there. People in there, all, all worked in there all summer working on it to make it look exactly the same as it was. So I don't know what's gone on there. But the train to Southport also has a Southport Manchester coming back. Now, the trains of the morning are already crowded. So if we cut in this service, it's going to make the more trains inaccessible to more people because they only have two carriages anyway. So I would think, you know, one service an hour is great, but I'd still try and retain both of them because we've got to get more people off the roads. We've got more people using public transport. Our roads are currently can't cope. Our surgeries, my emails, are full of people in Claremont expressing anger about the traffic, the snarl-ups, the gridlocks around morning time, evening time, and we can get rid of this with a proper public transport network. If we're cutting trains, we're making it worse. You know how it is in the south, they're putting more and more trains on in the south, and we're paying for it the north. The poorly run, out of date service, trains 30, 40 years old. They're bringing new trains online, so let's use these trains properly. Let's have more services running between Southport and Manchester on all our routes. I'll finish by saying that uh, we need to complement this as well with our bus services, so Transport Great Manchester that runs properly in the future, not just as an alternative to supporting the Metro Link, but all proper transport links within Greater Manchester. Okay, thank you, Chair. I just want to speak very briefly in favour of this motion. Um, because this is an important rail link, but what's really frustrating is that these changes to the service have taken place without any consultation. There's been no consultation with the local users, no consultation with communities in Salford, none with ward councillors, and none with the friends group who work tirelessly, giving up their time to support the rail services uh, and raise funds to, uh, to benefit the station uh, and the people of this city. So I think it is a dis disappointing situation. I just very briefly want to read... Um, a comment from the Friends of Wharton Station in relation to this matter. Uh, it says, the Friends of Wharton Station strongly believe that an hourly direct service should be reinstated from May 2020. 
and they fully support this motion. In our opinion, this hourly service by Wharton, along with an hourly service by Bolton, would be fair and equitable and will allow as many communities as possible to access this important leisure destination. So I say I fully support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Approximately, I fully support this motion. Approximately a year ago, myself and Councillor Birch had the pleasure of visiting the Salfordian Hotel in Southport. We were very impressed with the newly refurbished building and its picturesque surroundings in Southport. Since becoming a councillor in 2016, I know that many Swinton residents who attend Critchley House Community Hub have enjoyed holidays at the Salfordian in Southport. Furthermore, as a group, the Swinton and Pendlebury councillors have received several worthy applications for stays at the Salfordian from our residents. These are residents who have been in poor health or require respite after looking after loved ones or are just simply in need of a break away. Most of these re residents travelled to the Salfordian Hotel on the train directly from Swinton. It would therefore be a total injustice if these people, many who are elderly and infirm, are deprived the pleasure of staying at the lovely Salfordian Hotel and breathing healthy sea air in the future because their route to Southport is made much less accessible from Swinton by a train company who has clearly not taken their needs into consideration. Thank you. Councillor Brooks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to publicly give my support to this motion um, brought forward by my fellow councillor, um, Ed, fellow Ward Councillor Edward. Um, I'd also like to just pay tribute to the fantastic Friends of Wharton um, Station for not just bringing this to our attention, but standing for all they do all year round for Wharton. Councillor Saunders. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, can I um, firstly uh, say on behalf of the opposition, we will be supporting the motion, although we're supporting the motion, not necessarily all the words of the people who have spoken, such as um, corporate nationalisation uh, of the <laughs> railways, but we will be supporting... <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, but we will be supporting the motion. Can I say, firstly... Um, Councillor Edwards, uh, can I congratulate you on what I thought was an excellent speech. Well researched, I'm assuming it was researched, Councillor Edwards, rather than you, you're speaking from memory about 1941 or 1888. Well, well, maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, can I say that uh, I have used that service? and members of my family do. I, I go to Southport frequently, usually on business, uh, as it were, and um, I usually drive by car. It is a dreadful journey. Unlike, for example, Blackpool, there is no motorway. That last bit, you either have to go through Ormskirk or Chorley, depending on which way you go. It is a bit of a nightmare, um, and the train <coughs> does provide a very, very useful service, as has been mentioned. Um, so uh, we fully support, as I've said, the motion on the paper. Thank you. City Mayor Dennett. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking, as you probably will imagine, in favour of the motion. Um, Southport is, is quite a special place in terms of my upbringing and my family life. It's somewhere I, I think quite nostalgically about. I remember my dad taking me there um, to the flower show and my nana and my granddad used to love going there and going to Lord Street and obviously riding donkeys on the beach and things like this. So, you know, actually accessing Southport is really, really important to places like Salford and places like Warrington, where, where I came from. And improving our access from a public transport point of view is absolutely critical because I know you know, those experiences of holidaying, if you like, over the summer holidays in Southport had a profound impact on family life. 
And, you know, in the city of Salford, colleagues in the room may not know this, but this year we had nearly 3,000 children who were reliant on food bank vouchers or food vouchers to tackle holiday hunger. You know, Southport might be the only option for them to actually enjoy some of their summer break. So improving transport connectivity and affordable transport connectivity to places like Southport from Salford is really, really important. So I wholeheartedly support this motion. Southport is a very special place, I feel, in the northwest England. And, you know, for me, it's really important we do our utmost to make sure that the transport services genuinely serve all of our communities in the city of Salford. We know what's been happening of late. You know, the performance of Northern has been shocking. It's been very well documented at combined authority meetings I've been attending, how poorly, um, operationally speaking, um, our train services are running at the moment. And then to add further insult to injuries, we find that the railway operators are acting unilaterally in terms of removing services from places like Salford. This is absolutely scandalous, and it demonstrates how, in many respects, the whole transport system isn't accountable to the people that use it, members of the public. How do we actually interface with driving what services we need within Salford, but also within Greater Manchester? I mean, I heard Councillor Turner say he's not in favour of nationalisation. Well, it was only the other day at the Convention of the North, the Prime Minister told us that we'll be having our railways um, given back to us. So potentially your own Prime Minister is in favour of nationalisation if we're going to be getting our railways back. Quite what that means, um, the devil's in the detail. Um, and we, we await clarity from the Department for Transport and clarity from the Prime Minister as to exactly what that means for Salford, for Greater Manchester and for the North. Um, but I'm very supportive of this motion. I think it's absolutely scandalous how this has been handled. And for the communities of Walkden, Little Halton, and that part of the city, this is a real lifeline to some of our young people and also some of our older people who love going to Southport, tackling issues of social isolation, going along to Southport with their friends. You know, really important stuff. And we mustn't underestimate the importance of being able to access the seaside. So fully support the motion. Thank you. Councillor King. Uh, very briefly, um, Chair, obviously uh, supporting this motion and um, commend uh, Council, Councillor Edwards and Dickman for their excellent um, representation of the local people. And I think the other important issue, I might, I might add, Southport was, um, I was a parliamentary candidate in Southport many years ago. Uh, they didn't favour me there, and I used to go by train occasionally from, from, um, from, from, the, from the city centre. Um, we need greater connectivity among communities. Uh, and by cutting off these local rail services, then you cut off that, that local connectivity. I mean, that's a serious, um, a serious impact on, on people in our local communities. But I think the other strong point is, um, perhaps somebody like myself or some people living in other parts of the city uh, wouldn't have much connection with uh, Walkton Station or even other small train stations. And this is the power of local democracy. And I think that that, by raising that to local councillors, they're able to raise it at a place like Eastwood, so that will be get an awful lot of extra publicity. Whereas, I don't like the idea of criticising uh, bureaucrats, but of course people will take decisions very distant from local communities, and if there was a local representative there to raise this kind of issue, then it probably would be lost. People might write to um, the local um, transport organisations that are making these cuts, and they would just simply ignore it. Whereas if we have local Democrats who are able to raise some change like this and able to make publicity about it, then that lends strength, I think, to the idea about local democracy. And I think that's a very important point to make here because if that uh, wasn't raised here today, it probably would have been forgotten. And hopefully, because of it's raised here today by Council, Council Edwards, hopefully that decision will now be changed. And that's the power of local democracy. I think that's a very important point. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you very much. There's nobody else indicated that they'd like to speak. Can I go back to Councillor Edwards? Is there anything you've heard that you'd like to respond to? 
nothing in particular, but I'd like to support the comments of Councillor Critchley and Councillor Brooks about how fantastic Friends of Watchin Station are. Um, this timetable is due to come into force, uh, into force in December, and it would have been really easy for us to miss that. So I really want to thank them for raising this issue and making sure, holding us to account as local representatives as well. Thank you. Can I now ask then that we move on to vote on the motion that's been placed before us? All those in favour, say aye. All those against? Any abstentions? Can we then move on to the second motion before us that relates to the fully funded pay, uh, proper pay rise for local government uh, workers and is being proposed by you, City Mayor Dennett. Okay, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this local authority has a long track record in terms of protecting Green Book terms and conditions of and prioritising employment standards, not only within the City Council, but also within the City of Salford. What I want to draw attention to is the context within which this sits. At the moment, we have a significant challenge with our low-pay economy. And what I'm talking about there is 17.1% of workers aged 25 and over paid less than two-thirds of median hourly pay. That's 4.2 million people. 24% of employees are paid less than the real living wage. That's 6.5 million people in work. And you'll be familiar with the real living wage because at the moment, Salford City Council, as far as I understand it, is the only local authority within Greater Manchester to be an accredited living wage local authority. Also, 7.3% of the workforce, 2 million employees, are paid at or below the minimum wage. Yes, we do have a labour market where illegal employment practices are happening. Yes, we do have employers within the city region and within the country not actually paying the government's minimum wage. And in 2018, weekly pay fell due to a fall in the average hours work. So that's underemployment. That's where people are wanting full-time hours, but their employer is not giving them the hours they want. Through unemployment, it's currently at 4% number of zero-hour contracts and un unwanted kind of part-time jobs is higher than it was in 2008. And underemployment is still higher than it was in 2008. That's the context within which this motion sits. Now, looking to local government, we know 60p in every pound has been cut from local authority budgets since 2010. The LGA are telling us that one in three councils fear that they will run out of funding to provide statutory and legal duties by 2022-23. And councils face a funding gap of eight billion pounds by 2025. Because we have a government committed to austerity, and austerity as we know disproportionately plays out in local government. Local government workers have seen years of pay restraint, and the majority of pay points have lost 22% of their actual value since 2009-10. What has this led to? It's led to a significant reduction of public sector workers within local government. It has increased workloads. It has led to work intensification, stress and anxiety because of potential job insecurity. This is local government in 21st century Britain. And across the UK, an estimated 876,000 jobs have been lost since June 2010. Those job losses have disproportionately impacted women. Why? Because women make up three quarters of the local government workforce. This is the context 
within this within which this motion sits today. We've been at the vanguard of really pushing the boundaries of employment standards in the city of Salford. We have aspirations to become a living wage city, not just looking at the local authority, but thinking beyond our organisational boundaries. And this also comes at a time when I find out that civil servants working for the Department for Exiting the European Union are likely to see a 7.6% pay increase because of the really important work they're doing for the United Kingdom. Whilst at the same time we know in this chamber that paying pay increases to local government workers has absolutely no relationship with local government financing. Every year we go through pay consultation at a regional level and we make the case for paying our workers a decent wage, for paying the real living wage. What are we told time and time again? It is a local decision. It is a matter for the local authority. The Chancellor's spending round recently, there was no announcement on a financial contribution for local government workers. Nothing came out of the 2019 spending round to say we will give local government workers a pay increase because we know they are working really hard and they have suffered years of pay restraint. It's scandalous what's going on in local government. So without going on, I think the data corroborates why I'm extremely supportive of this motion today and why I'm standing to propose it. You've seen the motion and I'll now hand over to Councillor Hines to second the motion. Thank you very much. Councillor Hines. I'm only too pleased to, uh, to second the motion. Um, the City Mayor has gone into great detail, um, giving all the facts and figures that I don't want to, to, to repeat. But I've always felt we talk here about what we believe in um, from each political party. But at the end of the day, for however much we speak, it doesn't matter if we haven't got the workers dedicated to provide the services uh, that the people of this city need. And I have got upon my feet many, many times and defended our workers, uh, certainly over the last nine years, as they've seen uh, their numbers diminish time and time again, which has meant more than the stress that the mayor has illustrated. And the dedication of our workers at the times has been uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, anybody able to uh, really come and say uh, the city council workers are not pulling their weight. There is no question at all we have seen their pay restraint over the years. And when they have had a rise, it's generally below inflation. So their pay packets at the end of the month are far, far worse than they were eight, nine years ago in real terms. So I've got no problem at all um, in supporting the motion. Again, as the city mayor has said, uh, the government, as far as the, they're concerned, it is the local authority's decision whether it pays its workers. And as the mayor has said, to do that has often meant if we were to increase those uh, salaries, it could mean service cuts elsewhere because of the money that's uh, in there. We ourselves cannot, um, and it would be wrong of me to say that we are, if the unions came forward uh, next week and asked for a seven, eight, nine, whatever percent it was, in real world, uh, we could not afford that. It's central government that's got to fund this. Without doubt, the mayor has gone on to show that late, we are a low-paid economy. We see zero hours. We see low pay. He's already illustrated that. And the time's enough to make a stand. And I'm fully behind the city mayor, and I hope that this council is fully behind us in going forward to government and saying, look, enough's enough. Come forward pay the people of this country, this authority, and other authorities in the country a right and proper wage. And I'm proud, as the Mayor has said, 
We are the only authority that I know that pays the real living wage. And I'm proud of that. A lot of the low pay in this authority, and we have low pay, uh, are now much better off than they ever were before. So I support or second this motion. Thank you, Matt. Can we now, Councillor Mary wants to speak. Well, I'm astonished, quite frankly, that we're not having a speaker from what I now call the Dominic Cummings Supporters Club <laughs> uh, on the left-hand side. Um, I would have thought that they would want to, to say something about this. Um, I'm particularly unimpressed with the fact that the Brexit civil servants are getting a 7.6% uh, pay rise. Um, I can hardly see that this is payment by results, judging by the <laughs> chaos that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, and the fact is that um, people who have been widely praised by the Conservative Party in the past, the former Chancellor, um, a, a Chancellor who I remember, Kenneth Clark, who I suspect was supported by a significant number of Conservative uh, people, um, are no longer in the Conservative Party. And I wonder if uh, the people here are considering their position as to whether they can be part of this new style model Conservative Party. This motion is incredibly important. Um, if some of you saw the demonstrators outside protesting about the actions of some of our staff um, during the week, you will know that our staff have been put under incredible pressure to make the, these very difficult decisions. And they're making those difficult decisions and um, being conscientious about making those difficult de decisions despite the fact that they've had their pay unfairly constrained over the years. And I want to place on record my tribute to the staff that work um, for um, not just the Children's Services uh, Director, but other parts of the Council in terms of day after day, they have actually kept the services in Salford going. And up and down the country, local authority workers are the key workers who are going to be delivering future services for the people of this country. And dare I say it, it will be local authority workers who will catch uh, the brunt of a no-deal Brexit as well. And they will be expected to deliver in terms of all the measures that will be required at the ports, in terms of all of the inspection regimes that will be, uh, be expected of us. And all of that will be, uh, for the most part, delivered by local authority workers. And we need to be supporting them. And I'm proud, yes, I'll, I'll say it straight away, I am a member of the GMB as one of the unions who are supporting this motion. And I've heard from them all the accounts that they've had of members of, of their union struggling over the time, the period of concern. So we've been told by the Chancellor that this is an end to austerity, that we're seeing an end to austerity. I seem to remember Theresa Bay saying something similar um, previously as well. I don't know how many ends to austerity uh, can actually be announced by the government. But the fact remains that what we've had is a spending spree uh, by Johnson in an attempt to buy an election. That's basically what we've had. And unfortunately, local government workers don't seem to be part um, of his concerns about the future of this country. Well, I think it's time that we stood up for the people we employ to say they are entitled to a decent wage, that they are entitled to support from central government who in the end decides a large chunk of the money that we have. And if the Chancellor promised to fund this in full, I'm sure that Councillor Hines and others up and down the country would promise to pass that on to the workforce. And that's what we need. We need a decent paid workforce so that they can continue to do the vital job for this country. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mary. I'd like to invite other councillors into the debate and start with Councillor Walker. First time, sorry. 
thank you, Chair. And um, can I say this is my first time speaking uh, as a councillor to this council. Um, and I'm very proud and honoured to have been elected by the people of Irwell Riverside and hope to serve them for years to come. Um, can I just say that in respect of the, my experiences, I've worked for 29 years, I worked for this local authority before taking voluntary service in 2015. So I've seen the changes over the three decades. And uh, the changes have been stark, quite stark. When Thatcher came to power in 1979, the first thing she tried to do was attack public services and local authorities' funding. And uh, she did it in a number of ways, pay freezes, pay cuts, but also trying to encourage outsourcing uh, throughout the 1980s and 90s until she uh, was, was removed from office. And um, that was a very difficult time for local authorities and for local government workers who saw their pay drop substantially over that period of time. So although the figures talk about you know, more recent history, if you go back to, to the 1980s, it really started there in, 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 in significant proportions. And things didn't really improve that much in the 90s. Um, there was some impact, there was pay awards given through the local authority negotiations with the national level, but they were always below the rate of inflation and never met the needs of the, the workers in public services. So again, the 1990s weren't that great either. And since austerity in 2015 and the uh, current shambles of a government trying to uh, dismantle um, funding for local authorities, um, that has caused increased in hardship for the people who work in public services. And that's a knock on effect on the local economy and the local communities because people, when they get pay rises, will spend their money more often than not because they most of them can't afford to save and they will spend on local, on local services, on local products, and local shops. So it affects a, an impact and an, an impact on the local economy as a whole. Um, and what is also noticeable is that how many local government workers and public service workers across the country require benefits as top-ups, whether it be child tax credit, working tax credit, whatever tax credits they can get available to them, and how many are going to food banks, increasingly going to food banks. This is how difficult life has been made for, for dedicated, hard-working and loyal public sector workers. And I was a Unison activist as well, a NALGO, National Local Government Officers Association, and then Unison activist throughout these years. So I was sat in negotiations, uh, and we heard and discussions at local level as well about pay. And we knew how difficult it was for local authorities to find the money because they've been starved of cash, starved of cash by Tory governments and the condemned governments more recently. So it's, it's hypocritical for central government to point the finger at local authorities and say it's their fault that local government and public sector workers are not getting the pay they deserve. So I heartfeltly, warmly and congratulate uh, the Mayor and Council Hines for bringing this to this meeting, and I hope that every councillor who can should be a member of a trade union. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to fully support this motion. Um, I proudly serve the people of Wheaton and Seedley. And that is a very deprived area, an area where residents depend very much on the services provided by this council. We all know that it's the cuts that prevent the pay rise. We all know how much the council has lost. We know how that has played out in terms of the pressures on the workers. Efficiencies have been made. People have worked hard to work within the budget and, and so much so that some dedicated workers actually work overtime in order to get the work done. So we have a really good workforce who are struggling um, and struggling to bring up their own families. They've got the pressure of work and they've got the pressure of making ends meet because they haven't had a pay rise for so long. And I take the point that Councillor Walker made, that there was pressure on pay before the cuts, and pay hasn't gone up very much for the local authority workers for a long time. 
I think we're very lucky to have the workforce that we have. And I think it's time central government rewarded all of their hard work. And, and they agreed to fund a well-deserved pay rise for local authority workers. Councillor Brooks. Councillor King. Very briefly, Chair, I just want to touch on the point that uh, Councillor Walker made, um, which is the wider economic impact. Um, local authorities, obviously, um, I support this motion, obviously, and we've always believed in a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, and I think that generally our offices provide uh, very good services across the city, and also, indeed, uh, we're, we're noticing as local councillors uh, the decline of services in our local areas. Uh, but the wider economic issue is that councils very often are the largest employers in a particular area. And the result of that is this, that this bend from that goes into the local economy, as Councillor Walker has rightly said. And it's called the velocity of money, as the economists refer to. And the more that money circulates in the economy, the more often that it does, uh, then the greater economic activity, and therefore the more uh, you're able to sustain uh, the livelihoods of the local, local economy. By reducing that, um, then it means that there's less economic activity and the economy begins to slow down and you end up with higher uh, unemployment levels. And the great, um, great right-wing economic guru Milton Friedman has now come out and said that when President Hoover of the United States uh, withdraw support from the American economy of the 1930s, it caused the great crash uh, of the 1929-1930. And this government has pretty much done the same thing since 2010 by reducing uh, the, the support for the economy has resulted in significant decline of local services and more stress on local people. And we're getting that in our inboxes almost on a daily basis. People constantly uh, contacting us that they need to acquire more services. So I very much believe and the way to turn that around, the high wage economy very often means that there's um, a greater, more successful economy. And, and I think that the government needs to move on this. And if they don't, then we're going to become low-wage economy, which isn't a place for an economy in the Western world to be. And I hope that uh, this council will support this motion. I indicated that they would like to speak. So in that case, councillor, oh sorry, Mr. Tennant, the city where, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, can I thank colleagues for your comments and support for the motion? Um, I'm also mindful that our opposition colleagues haven't spoke on the, the debate on local government pay, which potentially is quite insightful, and it'll be interesting to see what happens at the vote. But can I just thank the role of our trade unions within the local authority, but also within the labour market and society more generally, because they're doing a fantastic job in what are exceptionally difficult times. And can I also place on record my thanks and appreciation to the staff within the City Council, who I know are motivated by the public sector ethos. They go beyond the call of duty to serve the people of our city. Colleagues in this chamber know what our financial pressures are. Since 2010, we've lost £211 million. 53% of the grant we get from government has been taken away from this local authority. Government tell us time and time again, every single year, that pay increases is a local decision and there's absolutely no relationship between what we get from government through the revenue support grant and what we want to pay our staff. That isn't the case for the whole of the state and government are clearly interested in pitting different parts of the state against each other when it comes to pay equity in terms of pay increases. Councillor King made reference to the wider economic impact and I'm cognizant that a lot of the people within our local authority live locally and work for this city council. So absolutely, paying our workers a decent human wage that enables them to actually make ends meet is good for the city of Salford. It is good for society and it's certainly good for our local economy. 
But I'll finish on this, and it's an important point. On the day of the Chancellor's spending announcement, it was also the 80th birthday of the Citizens Advice Service within the United Kingdom. The Citizens Advice Service was born out of post-World War II to support people in understanding what their rights and responsibilities were, but also to support people who were struggling to make ends meet. And on the same day of their 80th birthday, the Chancellor's spending announcement made absolutely no promise whatsoever for lifting the cap on benefits. So make no bones about it, this next year is going to be very difficult for some of the poorer members of society. Why? Because universal credit will not be increasing by inflation. Working tax credits will not be increasing by inflation. But the cost of living, as we all know in this chamber, continues to increase. This will push more and more people into poverty. And that includes those that work. As the statistics I shared at the start about the state of our national labour market corroborate, you know, it's scandalous when the government point to the official unemployment statistics, because they know behind all of that, people even in work are really struggling to make ends meet. And that is why this motion is so important, because this is about lifting people out of relying on benefits, paying them a decent wage, giving them economic independence to live a normal life that many of us take for granted in being able to make ends meet. So I wholly hearted support this motion and recommend it to members of council. And I hope everyone will vote in favour of this motion today, including our Conservative colleagues. Thank you. Not a speech, just a point of order. Um, Councillors Mary and Walker were good enough to mention their union affiliations in their speeches. Would it not be appropriate, given the nature of the uh, motion, for all members at least of the three unions to declare the very least a non pecuniary interest? Councillor Saunders, all members have already declared their interest and submitted them to the member's office. Okay. Can we then move to the vote on the motion and ask all those in favour to say yes? Aye. All those against? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion is moved. And accepted. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is go forward to have a 10 minute break and be back here in the chamber for 22.11. Thank you. Please be seated. 
we're going to move straight on now then to item number eight, which is the statement from the city mayor. Okay, um, good morning, members of the council. Um, it's a pleasure for me to address council today. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege, really, in many respects. And unlike our parliamentary colleagues, um, this council chamber is certainly not prorogued. For many of us watching on at Westminster, um, the spectacle of stretching and distorting parliamentary rules and procedures to achieve no deal is fascinating. It's also deeply worrying. The former Chancellor Philip Hammond has stated that the Conservative Party has been infiltrated in a bid to turn the party into an extreme right-wing faction. With the former Tory MP Nick Bowles also stating that Boris Johnson's new cabinet is proof that the Conservative Party has been fully taken over by the hard right. Alongside these comments, Conservative MPs who have now had the whip removed include party stalwarts like Ken Clark, Oliver Letwin, and even Churchill's grandson, Nicholas Soames. And it seems that the current leadership under Boris Johnson will stop at nothing to maintain its existence. With total contempt for every convention and tradition which has historically held this country together. We have seen lies to the monarchy, attacks against the judiciary, and a prime minister who chooses to rule by decree without parliamentary mandate, threatening and undermining parliamentary democracy at every opportunity, it would seem. The planned No Deal Brexit could likely see the end of the Union and the final fragmentation of the United Kingdom. What many observers in this room will find most astonishing is that the Conservative Party, the party of Disraeli, Balfour and Eden, the oldest political party in the world and purportedly the natural party of government, is propagating these attacks on hallowed British institutions. All the while, the real brains behind Boris is not even a Conservative Party member. Dominic Cummings, the architect of Johnson's personal survival strategy. It is not surprising that many commentators are claiming that the Conservative Party as we know it is dead. But whilst the drama of Whitehall continues and Tory leadership twists and turns, putting its own survival above the needs of our country, here in Salford, we must carry on with the day-to-day -day running of services that people desperately need. And our collective endeavours to ultimately realise what is a better and fairer Salford. We've recently received news of the Chancellor's 2019 spending round and its implications for the next financial year. And I have to say, at first glance, it looks like good news. Something I guess we'd expect from the incumbent government in the run-up to what is looking like a potential general election. It seems likely that Salford will receive more money, more resources than we'd been anticipating. And I say likely because we still have not been given the formula by which the government will be distributing and allocating many of the announcements made in the spending round. And this obviously follows moves on the part of the government and also you know, hard-fought debates within the local government association to diminish the role of deprivation and poverty and its importance within the revenue support grant methodology. In favour of what we knew at the time of rurality, 
which would inevitably benefit already wealthy Tory shires. But for now, it seems to me that common sense has prevailed, despite the fair funding review being kicked into the long grass for another year. But ultimately, the implications of all of this for local government are still uncertain. And we probably won't know until the end of next financial year, as we enter that new spending round. We also know that government funding formulas are designed to benefit wealthy areas, often at the expense of the poor. And we know from the work we've been doing within Greater Manchester through the combined authority and the work that Councillor Mary has been doing with key cities, that 80% of £7 billion worth of funding for housing and housing infrastructure is being spent in the south of England over the last few years. We know that where appeals are made, Tory chancellors will reach out to do backroom deals with Tory authorities like Surrey County Council, who in 2007, colleagues will remember, received a whole 1.66% of the entire £2 billion made available nationally for social care. The infamous sweetheart deal as it's colloquially understood. And on top of that, we know prior to the sweetheart deal, there was transitional grant funding going into exactly the same local authorities. So we know that if possible, safe labor Salford will once again be ignored or disproportionately impacted by the chancellor given half the chance, as this city has actually always been. And in order to realise the Chancellor's spending announcements for local government, it's important that you understand this. The Treasury has once again assumed an overall increase in council tax of 4%. Colleagues, I say to you, this is not a spending round. This is actually a taxation round. They're spending the people of Salford's money in their national headline-grabbing data. And that includes, obviously, the 2% increase for adult social care, the precept that the government introduced. But it also assumes that council tax bases up and down the country have actually risen by 2%. So if you've not seen housing growth as a local authority, you won't be realising that 2% increase. All of this, rather than doing what is obvious, which is putting money into the revenue support grant, and allocating it according to need. And since 2016, Treasury assumptions on council tax increases have led to a 36.3% council tax raises for local residents here in the city of Salford, based on our own calculations. The Tories who claim to be the party of low taxation are in fact passing the burden of taxation down the ladder to replace levels of income tax and corporation tax. And I say that at a time that we know Amazon have tripled, tripled their profits, but corporation tax paid to the Treasury is actually halved on the previous year. I say this at a time when the chief executive of Persimmon pays himself £39 million, pounds, or pays themselves £39 million, pounds, which could have actually employed 1,561 construction workers on an average salary. So instead we see assumed increases on flat taxes like council tax and VAT. We know in this chamber that those are regressive taxes which hit the poorest residents and small businesses the hardest. We also know that the Treasury has not done its sums in calculating if the new money is affordable or sustainable, in line with their own fiscal rules. The Office for Budget Responsibility, the government's own fiscal watchdog, established by George Osborne, has described the announcements as very strange, lacking in fiscal forecasting and modelling required for it to do its job of monitoring the book. It is an unhypothecated increase in spending which is only guaranteed for a year. 
Arguably, it's nothing more than a pre-general election splurge of reserves left in the bank by Philip Hammond's tenure. And once it's gone, who knows what the potential consequences of all of this are. Unlike Labour, this money is seemingly not to be invested in key infrastructure, in the decarbonisation agenda, or in long-term projects beneficial to the Treasury. It is simply to be spent, preferably in such a way as to buy short-term support for another Conservative government. Meanwhile, nine years of Tory austerity, as we know in this chamber, has crippled the country. Violent crime has been steadily rising. Homelessness has spiralled out of control. Millions are using food banks, including nurses and teachers. Hospitals are overcrowded and overflowing, and the low-paid, low-skilled jobs market created by the purported Tory recovery does not provide the stable, decent terms of employment many millions desperately need. And in Salford alone, nearly 3,000 children at the last count were given emergency food vouchers over the holidays to stave off hunger. This is shameful in 21st century Britain, let alone in the fifth richest economy in the world. And it is precisely for the, these reasons that we've endorsed the GMB, Unison and Unite, the union motion earlier in this session of council, calling for fair funding settlement for local government workers who've seen the majority of pay points losing 22% since 2009-2010. And regarding homelessness, the huge spike in demand for services coupled with increased statutory responsibilities through the Homelessness Reduction Act are putting more pressure on council coffers at a time when budgets are being slashed. In 2010, only seven individuals were counted as sleeping rough on the streets of our city. By 2017, that has increased to 49. Thanks in part to the introduction of Mayor Burnham's Bed Every Night initiative, in addition to the amazing work of our housing options officers, numbers of rough sleepers in the city of Salford have started to reduce to 26, the highest reduction within Greater Manchester. But we need to do more. Nobody should be sleeping rough on our streets in the 21st century. Salford has also just been notified that just over one and a half million will be made available primarily from health colleagues, so the CCG Health and Social Care Partnership, to support phase two of bed every night, running to the 30th of June 2020. 110 beds will be available from October the 1st, 2019. A huge amount reflecting the success of this council in supporting our homeless people. But Finding emergency accommodation for homeless is only one small part of the problem. Without serious numbers of truly affordable housing, council housing, there is no hope of us actually solving the problems of homelessness once and for all. And that's why this council has invested significantly in Derive, our wholly owned housing company, to build truly affordable housing for the people of our city. Derive has taken on 20 properties recently in Charlestown with a further six in Duchy and hundreds more have been planned for in the near future. These are truly affordable properties for the people of our city and we'll be building them without the slightest bit of help from the government who through the national planning policy framework seem to favour development profits rather than truly affordable housing. Housing is not only the area in which Salford Council must go its own way. Members will recall that last council, a climate change emergency was declared in this chamber unanimously. And as a result of that, the City Council has established a new board aiming to develop a carbon budget, implementing a 2030 target for carbon neutrality, aligned with the policy pledges within Greater Manchester's plan 
the homes, jobs and the environment. This council has a policy of not investing in fossil fuel companies. We have incorporated a policy in our treasury management strategy that all investments fully support the ethos of social responsibility. And since 2016, the council has invested over 1.5 million in carbon reduction schemes, with a further 2.5 million scheduled in 2020-21. And none of this vital investment is accompanied by central government support. Once again, we must find the way ourselves locally. The climate crisis is one of the gravest threats faced by human civilization today. It is genuinely an existential crisis for all humanity. The international community has now given up on its initial target of two degrees of warming over the course of the next century, which is seen as unrealistic. We are now committed to between two and three degrees warming target in that time. Temperatures rises will produce between two or five amounts of annual droughts, displace 275 million people through sea level rises with the additional loss of hundreds of thousands of species of animals. And on the 20th of September, between 12 noon and 12.30, the trade unions will be taking part in the Global Day of Action on Climate Change and calling for people from all over the world to walk out in support. Please join us on the Civic Centre lawns and let's keep up the fight to have our planet still habitable for the future generations. Carbon reduction is not the only issue facing humanity in terms of the environment. We're also facing a huge challenge around biodiversity. This council continues to be proactive in the face of the government cuts and austerity. And those that are not interested in people suffering in 21st century Britain. The strains placed on public service provision by the policies of austerity and the damage done through our politics through shameless electioneering. Our capital investments in the city of Salford over the years have guaranteed economic growth. Where elsewhere in Greater Manchester, we've actually seen stagnation. Increasing our council tax base, increasing our business rate base, helping us to protect jobs and services in this local authority. And the growth that we've seen in this city has protected our residents from the worst impacts of brutal Tory austerity. And we continue to provide services for those most in need. This council has recently had the honour of being awarded the Support to the Armed Forces Community Award, accepted on our behalf by our veterans champion, who unfortunately can't be with us today, Councillor Barry Warner. And in a previous speech, I've informed the council of the introduction of new dedicated housing role to support our armed forces community in the city. This is driving fantastic successes for the city. But as the Westminster drama continues to unfold in London, in Salford, we are still here putting the people of our city first. Whilst Westminster continues to provide local government with nothing but problems, it is our job here in Salford to find solutions to the issues our residents face day in, day out. We will continue to fight on. As a Labour authority, to defend the interests of this city against the policies of a government that doesn't know and seemingly does not care. We will continue to put the interests of our residents first to build a better and fairer Salford. Thank you very much. If there's any questions or comments uh, you want to place to the City Mayor, please indicate. up on there was decarbonisation, truly affordable homes, biodiversity. Um, on the same week, 
um, that we see once again the announcement that so the viability testing has been on Chat Moss uh, this week on Monday. The council continues on its plan to decimate the Salford lungs. Salford City Council is calling on committees to support a climate change crisis, but in the very same breath, seems happy to hand over the very land that stores huge amounts of carbon and could help Salford avoid its very own climate crisis in the future. Chat Moss is an incredibly special place. It's home to vast numbers of wildlife whose habitats will be destroyed if these proposals go ahead. With no additional infrastructure and reliance upon already overcrowded railway station, we will see upwards of 3,000 additional vehicles using a congested B road to get in and out of the district. Claims by Councillor Antrobus that this is only a tiny part of degrading Mossland are utterly contemptuous. The cost to remediate a site a 70th of the size of the old council offices is close to a half a million pounds in remediation costs. This infers that the proposal could be in excess of 30 to 40 million pounds. I call upon this council and those supporting these proposals to remove chat moss from the draft local plan and urge Mayor Dennett to do the same for the GMSF. Planning officers have promised the results of the land test will be made public. Can I ask also that the costs are made public by Urban Vision? Chat Moss is truly a special environment. This should not and must not be happening. And as a councillor for the Ward of Earlham, I will continue to do all I can to highlight his plight. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, not long ago, Swinton Lions celebrated their 150th anniversary. But just three years later, rumours confirmed that the Swinton Board were looking to rename the club to Manchester Lions. This decision has received decidedly mixed reactions amongst fans. While some believe it was the right thing for the club to do to survive in years to come if central funding was lost, there are also many more fans who are understandably upset that this change would be the end of the club in their 153-year history. Following the board's announcement, the city mayor, along with the councillors of Swinton and Pendlebury, wrote to the board to relay the concerns of the many residents who had been in touch about the loss of the name and concerns about the lack of the consultation with fans. Additionally, whilst the city mayor and councillors understand that this decision must have been made under very difficult circumstances, it's important that the club did not did not approach the city mayor and the local councillors about the concerns for the future of the club. Through discussion, alternative options might have been found, assisting the club in preserving its name and heritage. I'm sure the mayor and other Swinton Pendable councillors share my feelings in praising the work the board have been doing in recent years to steady the ship, and this can be seen by the results on the field with, this, with the team this year securing their highest finish in over 20 years. Um, I believe there's been further correspondence with the club so I'd ask the Mayor, could you provide an update on the situation, as well as provide reassurances to the club, players and fans that the Council do, will do what they can to support the club in these uncertain times. Thank you. Councillor Pavick. Uh, yes, um, following on the note from uh, Councillor Dickman, I hope the uh, Mayor will join him in offering his congratulations to Salford Red Devils who this week secured themselves third place in the Super League despite being on the second lowest budget, a community club for the community run by the community. It's a great advert for the game and hopefully we'll have further success. We know what it's like to be in a bad place and hopefully we can regenerate the land around the ground as well so we have further success in the future. Thanks, Chair. Um, firstly, can I, can I thank Ceremonial Mayor on behalf of the local Jewish community for the honour given to us by asking Rabbi Benji to give the address this morning. Much appreciated. Um, in terms of climate change, can I commend uh, observance of the Sabbath, in which we don't drive or do other things for 25 hours. It's a wonderful way of uh, 
contributing towards helping to prevent climate change. Anyway, um, apart from that, can I just say uh, the mayor mentioned, the uh, city mayor mentioned the uh, armed services uh, uh, contract covenant. Um, I understand there will be an award ceremony in October to which myself and my colleagues who are on the, uh, the, the Reserve Forces Association uh, have been invited to and I hope to attend, subject to there being no general election on that day. Um, um, finally, I just want to mention uh, that I've had the honour of having been um, sponsored by my group. Uh, I've been appointed to the Community Wellbeing Committee of National Committee of the Local Government Association as a reserve member, although, believe it or not, I've already attended a, a briefing session for all members of committees. And the, I've been invited to the very first meeting because one of the members can't attend it, so I'm already going to go down next Friday. So I regard that as an honour, and I thank the council for agreeing to fund my expenses for that. Um, <laughs> um, and um, council might also be interested to know that I've been invited to be a panellist at the Conservative Party Conference, if I can mention that name, an organisation called Turning Point, which many of you may be familiar with. Thank you. Councillor McCusker. Um, I'm just wondering if the Mayor could join me in celebrating the fact that the announcement yesterday by Councillor Lancaster that Bowden Lodge um, Over 60s Club will be su further supported by the Council for another three years. Um, Local councillors have been working with the committee, um, with officers and with the Moncton Unitarian Church in coming up with a plan which will try and work towards full sustainability. And we've committed as local councillors to continue working with the group, even though we won't be able to use the Over 60s Club as eligible members for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gina Reynolds. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to comment on the spending round. Um, while I welcome 3.4% in better care fund resources within the NHS settlement, potentially benefiting our integrated fund, and no cut in the public health grant and an uplift of 2% with inflation, I find it disappointing the additional 1 billion grant uh, funding for adults, children, social care, for me, this is still totally inadequate. It's estimated that 10 billion more is required just to meet the care needs of older people, um, of o over 1 million older people in this country. 1.5 billion gap still in rehab services, 1.3 billion gap still in local authority funded care home places, 1.2 billion still needed for tackling social isolation nationally and 900 million shortfall in specialist housing. And to add insult to injury, giving local authorities, obviously following consultation, but local authorities who are facing the human cost of the care crisis, the potential to raise another 500 million by introducing a 2% social care preset, making once again the public pay the price for our social care crisis. In light of an ageing population, we need bold changes to deliver a long-term solution for adult social care. And in the meantime, we await the five times delayed green paper. What a disappointment this government is. Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I firstly want to pay tribute to Action Against Rural Development, uh, which is a group uh, within Earlham and Cadizhead for their uh, scrutiny of the, the location of the test um, drilling that Councillor Golden referred to, uh, to ensure that uh, test drilling uh, undertaken by Urban Vision on behalf of this City Council uh, shows a representative view uh, of peak depths on Chatmos, which I, uh, I hope, uh, as with uh, probably the majority of residents in Earlham and Cadizhead, that uh, it is unsuitable for building on it. I, I want to say uh, and keep my contribution to this council meeting today positive and say um, thank you and give my 
uh, support and credit to the people in our community that go beyond, uh, above and beyond the call of being a good uh, member of our community. Whether that be friends of Lordy Park who are working tirelessly uh, to upgrade uh, our park in Caddyshead on Lord Street, uh, whether that be residents of Caroline and Dixon Street, which joined, uh, who joined myself and Councillor Joan Walsh to uh, improve uh, the, the area and clean up the area, and actually the children of the King's Road Estate who came out last night to help tidy their community. Now, the, the organisations uh, and groups and the key individuals within this group so are in no means an exhaustive list of the people uh, that our community depends on to keep doing the work that it does. Uh, I think the work that community uh, communitarians do and the people in our community deserve every recognition, including uh, the people at Lady James Hall who uh, are, are really going above and beyond to, to tackle issues of loneliness and isolation and regularly holding voluntary uh, events for all members of the community of all ages. And that being the same of a lot of the groups I've mentioned. And finally, I want to say, and I'm sure the city mayor will join with me, as will the council, in supporting Councillor Pebbett in wishing Salford well in the playoffs, but also uh, wishing Earlham Town well in the second qualifying uh, fixture against York uh, in Earlham on Saturday. And uh, I'm sure all of us uh, will be uh, either tuned in on, on BBC iPlayer or on the sports app to wish Earlham well and to to bring the FA Cup home for Salford. <laughs> Councillor Fletcher. Yes, just uh, want to say a quick word. I'm sure that the um, City Mayor will join me in congratulating all those involved in putting on Salford's big day last Saturday. Uh, it's one of my favourite days of the year. It's one of the first days I put down in my calendar. Uh, I've attended, that was the fourth time biggest and best yet. So many wonderful initiatives going on in the city. And uh, I believe 7,000 people uh, went through the, the big day on Saturday. So well done to all those involved in the organization and indeed all those who attended. Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for all the nice things you said about the government, if in fact you said any nice things. I think you may have mentioned on the positive a couple of times. Um, I've been sitting here patiently waiting for someone on the other side of the chamber to mention what an important month this is. This is the month on the 12th of September 2015, a certain Jeremy Corbyn was elected as leader of the Labour Party, isn't it? And I honestly am disappointed in you people for not bringing out that fact. Really. So um, I, I remind you all now, I'm sure you know, I'm, I'm absolutely positive you know. Um, I would like to associate myself with the remarks from Councillor Gordon regarding Chat Moss. Um, I'm with him on that. Um, and basically, um, all the criticism the government has suffered under the time that Paul Dennett, the city mayor, has been in post. Um, <laughs> it's been very repetitive at times, but you do have to ask yourself what the alternative is. And quite frankly, if you're worried about this government and its, and its actual policies, for goodness sake, the alternative is unthinkable. You will be hit, the working person will be hit so hard if he ever gets power. But on this side, we really do hope that Jeremy continues to be leader of the opposition because that will ensure a conservative government all the time he is in opposition because the people of this country will see that. And uh, for that, I will finish. Time's getting on. I must say that I do look forward to these meetings. They are beautifully conducted and the content is theatrical at times. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Mary. 
Well, what an interesting contribution from the leader of the Dominic Cummings Supporters Association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to mention Dominic Cummings because we used to have a Conservative Party that claimed it believed in the British Constitution and believed in the rule of law. Now we have a Conservative Prime Minister who clearly doesn't believe in the British Constitution and has refused to say whether he will obey the law or not um, as put forward by Parliament. And my question, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ch uh, Ceremonial Mayor, is does the Conservative Party still believe in parliamentary democracy or have they decided that dictatorship by a single person is the only answer? And um, I've had some experience of uh, dealing with Mr. Johnson. Um, some of you with long memories may remember that Salford was one of the many authorities that Mr. Johnson was forced to apologize to some years ago for lying about our particular policies. Um, he claimed in a Daily Telegraph column that Salford had banned the flying of the St. George's flag during the European Football Championships. In fact, it was completely untrue. Um, what we've done is warned taxis about flying um, the flags with the plastic uh, attachment to their windows, which was thought by the police to be dangerous, actually. Um, and he was forced to withdraw that remark. And to be fair to him, he said that Salford had joined the growing list of northern authorities that he'd had to apologize. This is a person who aspires to be the prime minister of this country. And one thing I've had a moan at, uh, at, at the mayor for is sending me to listen. I had the misfortune to listen to his speech uh, at the Convention of the North. And I have to say, um, I have never heard a prime minister of any political party make a more incoherent and rambling speech than Boris did on this particular occasion. In fact, Jen Williams absolutely nailed him when he pointed out that he created this wonderful fund for um, regenerating towns. Uh, and she pointed out that the vast majority of this money had been spent in marginal constituencies that the Conservative Party were, were trying to win. And what was Mr. Johnson's response? The accused of Jen Williams of being too cynical in terms of the way in which she perceived his actions. I have to say that we are in danger of becoming the laughing stock of the world, actually, quite honestly. For the Prime Minister we have, which really, I'm afraid, he doesn't care about anybody else other than himself in terms of seeing his way forward. And I have to say, I've never agreed with Nicholas Soames in the past, but I thought, and you lot should be ashamed of your party at the moment, you should be ashamed of the way in which you've expelled 28 members um, of your party who, who for the, the, the crime of voting once against the government. You know, this is absolutely appalling when you look at two chancellors and the grandson uh, of Winston Churchill actually being expelled from the Conservative Party, which clearly, for some strange reason, they happen to have an affection for. I have to say that Nicholas Soames' speech delivered in the House of Commons was one of great dignity and one which I would have thought the entire Conservative front bench um, would have been extremely ashamed that a member should have to deliver that. So, Mr. Mr. Mayor, we are going to have a very difficult period on our hands now in which we have a Prime Minister who doesn't care about Salford, I'm afraid, who is quite prepared um, to abuse the Constitution, to, to lie to the monarchy, to destroy every single unwritten convention that we've had in this country. And we are in severe danger of becoming a bit like a banana republic in South America. We've got to oppose this, and the only alternative to that is a government led by Jeremy Corbyn, which will govern in the interests of the people. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Chairman.
I'm surprised and shocked by Councillor Turner and the opposition. Councillor Reynolds, in her, when she gave her speech, talked about the social green paper. It's been delayed five times. Elderly people, disabled people, vulnerable people are floundering to try and get services and support in the community. And not one opposition member has chosen to stand up and condemn the action of the government in delaying once again this social green paper, uh, the, the, um, the green paper on social services. I think it's an absolute disgrace. There's nobody else has indicated, so can I go back to... Sorry? Councillor Edwards. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. In, in the spirit of supporting um, sporting celebrations in Salford, it would be remiss of me not to mention cricket. Um, Road Green first team have come third in the Greater Manchester Cricket Premier League. <laughs> Worsley Cricket Club first and second teams have been promoted uh, this season. And Walkden Cricket Club have again won the Bolton League and the Hamer Cup. Um, I'm sure this success is across the rest of the city as well, and I hope next year councillors can support our local cricket club. Thank you. Surprise, Councillor Mary said about Boris Johnson aspiring to be Prime Minister. Perhaps he missed the good news that he became Prime Minister. And additionally, I was, he, he refers to the government as a dictatorship. I'm a bit surprised because if Labour really thought they uh, are not fit for government, why don't they vote for a general election? Thank you. There is nobody has indicated. So we'll go back to the Premier and ask them to respond. Okay, um, so first of all, I think I'll respond to Councillor Goulden and the questions you raise around our commitment to carbon neutrality, which is in the redraft of Greater Manchester's plan for homes, jobs and the environment. Our commitment also to decarbonisation and our commitment to building truly affordable homes. I mean, colleagues will be aware in this chamber that I issued a, a letter to appeal holdings over the broad oak. Um, inquiry and as we've recently found out um, Peel want to appeal that again. To date this has cost this City Council in excess of £400,000 at a time when we've lost £211 million because of this Tory government. More cuts to come down the line but I want to highlight that because this local authority absolutely does value its green infrastructure, its green assets, and its green lungs. And where appropriate, we will continue to define the development community. But I have to be honest here, all of this hangs in something called a national planning policy framework. And as you'll know, we're now committed to building 201,000 homes over the period of the plan. We know the MPPF is geared in a way to empower the development community. In the, and when you think about that in line with austerity and cuts, you quickly realize where this is going. Government want developers basically to be allowed to be built anywhere. That's what government wants. They don't want us to fight the development community within the courts. And that is why it is really, really important we have a spatial framework. It's also why it's really, really important we have a local plan. Because without that, what is the alternative? Well, I'll tell you what the alternative is. Developers will come forward with proposals anywhere in the city of Salford. And that includes our parks and our green spaces and those spaces that we derive the maximum public utility from. We will then be forced to challenge them in the courts if we can't demonstrate a five-year land supply. That is the reality of the environment we find ourselves in, and that is why we desperately need a plan, both locally and at a city regional level, to ensure we deliver local housing need. Now, the go government, they're committed to an arbitrary housing target of 300,000 homes per year by the mid-2020s. That is what's happening. The whole of the UK economy and society is working towards delivering the government's arbitrary target. We have asked within Greater Manchester if governments can tell us 
how they've arrived at that number. I've still yet to receive any real response as to where the government have found this housing target from. But it's a real challenge at the moment because we know as a post-industrial part of the country, time and time again, we have real challenges on viability. Costs to remediate land, costs for infrastructure, costs support to support more schools being built within the city of Salford, and costs for that broader infrastructure piece um, around the city region. Infrastructure is probably one of the most challenging things we face within Greater Manchester at the moment. We've already heard the motion on the importance of our railways and how timetabling now is leading to further social isolation and its inability to access some of our fantastic beaches. So all of this is the environment within which we find ourselves. And I have to say, having a plan that genuinely delivers the homes we need, whilst also fighting for genuine investment in truly affordable housing, setting up our own housing company in Dereef, outside of the housing revenue account, to build for social rent and affordable rent, when the market isn't delivering that, places Salford in a much better place, I believe, than other parts of the country. So for me, it's absolutely critical we do that. Because the alternative, as I've already highlighted, is planning by appeal. That will cost this local authority an absolute fortune. That will have an impact on social care. That will have an impact on children services. So having a plan to deliver local housing need, a number that is determined by central government is absolutely the right space to be in. That doesn't mean we don't care about our green infrastructure. In fact, quite the contrary. The battle on Broadoak is because we are fighting to protect the green lung of the city. The investment today in some of our green spaces and parks, Peel Park, a good example, millions of pounds worth of investment in a green space, engaging in tree planting on a significant scale, linking that with tackling flooding within the city region through sustainable drainage systems, trying where possible to extract as much value as we possibly can from the development community to continue that agenda of greening the city of Salford. Salford, you might be interested to know, is 60% green. I have an ambition to continue to grow that, but we have to do it within the context of meeting our local housing needs. If we don't, the alternative is catastrophic. And I have told members of this chamber time and time again about the alternatives of not having a robust, evidence-based plan. Seriously, this is not a joking matter. This is serious. We need to plan for our future, otherwise the alternative is catastrophic. Specifically with relation to Chat Moss, I understand the value of the land in that part of the city. I also understand that Earlham Station has received significant investment. And you also probably know that Earlham Station has got more capital investment to come, to make it DDA compliant. So for me, Earlham Station is a real asset in the city of Salford. It's probably one of the most beautiful train stations I've certainly ever seen and been in. And obviously we want to celebrate that. We want more people to use Earlham train station. We want more people to use public transport. We want better infrastructure from Earlham and Caddishead. We want more buses and trains going to Earlham and Caddishead. We want the tram to Port Salford and ideally onto Earlham and Caddishead. We want all of this. But there is a system out there we have to engage with. And at the moment, we have a government that really doesn't care about the North. It hasn't given us the investment to do exactly what we need to do. And we're trying our best as a city council to extract that from the development community. Will that meet all our infrastructure requirements? No, it will not. Why won't it? Quite simply, because the North has been left out of, in the cold for many, many years when it comes to infrastructure funding. We are playing catch-up, and we will continue to do what we need to do. Just on this point, I want to ask Councillor Antrobus if you have anything further to contribute to the question raised as obviously the appropriate lead member, and I'm happy to let you speak on this.
thank you very much, uh, uh, sitting there. The, uh, the, I think there are two points that, that I'd like to make. Um, and the first uh, relates uh, to Councillor Turner's uh, comment um, supporting the withdrawal of Chat Moss from the, uh, the, the, the spatial framework. During the Broad Oak appeal, the inspector had found that Peel's arguments were convincing that the City Council did not have not the quantity of supply but the right kind of supply in terms of family homes and what they call aspirational homes. But he dismissed Peel's appeal because he saw that in the local plan there were allocations that would provide that. So if Councillor Turner is saying that they will withdraw an, an allocation without putting another one in its place and without telling us where he would develop instead of uh, the, uh, the, the, the Cadizet allocation, then what he is effectively doing is supporting Peel's case in the Broad Oak um, uh, uh, appeal. And that is a very dangerous position. Peel must be rubbing their hands, hoping that Councillor Turner will be elected as leader of this council at some stage because his policies would mean the development of the very land that this Labour group has sought to protect and preserve over many years since Ben Walsworth developed the policy of the, uh, the, the, the Greenway. Uh, and I think that that is shocking. And I'm sure that Councillor Turner doesn't realise what he said and the implications of what he said. But that's what it means. And that is a further demonstration of why the opposition just aren't good enough to uh, have a role in the running of this city. I was very hurt by uh, Councillor Gulden's comment that I was contemptuous of Chap Moss. Is it contemptuous to move a rejection of a planning application to extract peat from Chat Moss, even though all the advice was it was a lawful activity and you should uh, approve it? Was it contemptuous to follow that through to the appeal and the judicial review and to win a landmark case that meant for the first time local authorities could prevent peat extraction. I moved that, and it was this city council that stopped uh, peat extraction going on on Chat Moss. Was it contemptuous of me to uh, chair the, uh, the Greater Manchester Minerals <coughs> Plan Working Group and to get included in that policy document a policy which effectively banned the extraction of peat on Chat Moss and the rest of the Mosslands. Was that contemptuous? Was it contemptuous of me to sit on the local nature partnership and to support the introduction of the first nature improvement area in Greater Manchester, which encompasses the 40,000 hectares, not the 69 hectares that Councillor uh, Golden is talking about, but the 40,000 hectares of wetlands around Greater Manchester, was it contemptuous of me to support that and to ensure that we were working with organisations like the Lancashire Wildlife Life Trust for the first time in history to start to restore the Mossland because it is exactly what Councillor Golden says. It is um, a place which is full of wonderful wildlife and it is the most important ecological asset in Greater Manchester and it is a fantastic carbon uh, 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 sink. Uh, very important to, to, to that and that's why we've done it. So yeah, I am proud of what we did for the 40,000 hectares of wetland in and around Greater Manchester. I think that we've pay, played a pioneering role in that and we should be proud of it. Now, Councillor Golden says that this 69 hectares um, isn't a little bit of that 40,000, and, and uh, uh, people.
will make their own judgments about, about numbers. Um, but what he says is withdraw it. Withdraw it. Based on what? This speech was for, if this is that, then it will cost this. If this is that, it will mean so much. If, full of ifs. What we are doing in our work on the ground conditions survey is to find out the facts. We will find out the facts and then we will use those facts to inform a decision. And that is the right way to do things. It's the reasonable way to do things and not to do things simply because we've heard someone ranting and raving about it in the council chamber. Well, thank you. Thank you. Can I thank um, Councillor Antrobus really for reminding this chamber of his commitment to the environment and the green agenda within the city of Salford. And, you know, I'm heartened by the work you've done over many years, really, working with people like the Lancashire Wildlife Trust to realise that vision for the wetlands, the, the actual peat extraction that took place historically in our city and how you found a way through the legal system to ensure that that does not continue because you understand that peat is a natural carbon sink, which is really important for Greater Manchester in working towards that carbon neutrality by 2038. But also thank you for highlighting the intricacies of the national planning policy framework and how, you know, as politicians, we are, have to be and are required to be responsible in the decisions we make and how at times you have to constrain your emotions and even at times your, your ideology because by exercising that, it could potentially lead to chaos and a chaos that would empower the development community to do anything they want within our city. Thank you for reminding this chamber of the reality of the National Planning Policy Framework and planning legislation in 21st century Britain, upheld by what is a conservative government. Now on to the question raised by Councillor Dickman with regards to Swinton Lions. Colleagues in this chamber will know I issued a public letter um, when I found out that there was a potential that Swinton Lions would be changing its name to Manchester Lions. And obviously this hit the press and the national media and there was a statement released by the club itself. I have actually received a response to that letter. Um, I think it came in on, on Wednesday of this week. And yesterday I formally replied to that letter offering to meet with the club to look at how we can continue to support them in terms of moving forward with some of the challenges they're facing. Obviously, it came as a surprise to me, but I just want to reassure you as a, a ward councillor in Swinton South that I am committed to working with the club to look at what we can po possibly do to support them moving forward. So hopefully, we'll be meeting within the very near future to discuss the club's financial situation, any issues and concerns they may have, and how we as a local authority, with our partners actually, in the city of Salford, can continue to support them as we have done to date. Councillor Pevitt, thank you very much for drawing the Chamber's attention to how well Salford Rev Devils are doing. Um, they are absolutely doing fantastic, and it's great to see. I think they're a third in the league at the moment, and obviously they're going into the playoffs now with the potential of, of still winning it. So I absolutely do share your enthusiasm, and I wholeheartedly would like to congratulate the club in their great success, really putting the city of Salford on the map nationally and internationally. And as we have done to date, we will continue to support the club in terms of encouraging people to go to the game, to market and brand that, to share it with our partners in the city, and to really celebrate the role and the historic importance of the club in the city of Salford and our annual sporting calendar. So thank you for reminding us of that. Councillor Saunders, Thank you very much for sharing with members of the council your diary commitments. <laughs> um, 
I don't really know how I can respond to that other than saying well done on um, getting on the Community and Wellbeing Committee of the LGA. Hopefully you can be an advocate for the City of Salford and Salford City Council in those meetings in light of what you understand to be our challenges to date, many of them financial, as I've already highlighted. Also, I wish you all the best of luck at the awards ceremony for the armed forces community. I think what Salford are doing in the city with institutions like Broughton House is absolutely fantastic, and we will continue to build on all of those partnerships we have across the city. <laughs> Councillor McCosker, thank you very much for highlighting that since the last council meeting, progress has indeed been made on the issue of Bodden Lodge and that funding has been secured for another three years. And I understand the church has also supported us in terms of moving forward on some of those financial challenges. So I'd like to place on record my thanks and appreciation to all the councillors of Eccles Ward, because I know you've collaborated on working with the lead member, Council Lancaster, in looking for a solution and working obviously with the, the, the people who use the services of, of Bodden Lodge. So thank you for finding that resolution and absolutely I will continue to support the great work that Bodden Lodge does in the city. Councillor Reynolds, um, thank you very much for further embellishing some of the financial challenges certainly you are facing as the lead member for adults, public health, social care in, in the city of Salford. Um, you know, you do a sterling job and, uh, you know, I really appreciate everything you do. You know, quite often in, in the mayoral team office till 10 o'clock gone at night. So I, I'm only acutely aware, really, of your commitment to the city of Salford and the people of this city. But you are right. You know, the one billion announcement for adults and children's social care only scratches the surface in terms of the 10 billion required and one million people requiring our help and support. And you are also right to highlight the 500 million that the Chancellor announced. That is to be funded through local taxation. It's a 2% increase on the adult social care precept that will realise that 500 million. It is not new money from government, despite how it's being portrayed nationally for the people of this country. And, you know, I join with you and Councillor Morris in saying it's absolutely shameful that the green paper on social care has been delayed five times. It really gives you a sense, doesn't it, of what the government's priorities really are. They're clearly not our ageing population. They're clearly not the people who desperately need help and support. And we know since 2010, you know, that intermediate range of people requiring our services, we can no longer provide those services too because we've lost £211 million. Pounds. So you're absolutely right to call out this shocking further delay on the part of the government around the Green Paper on social care. And again, I highlight time and time again, the government favour regressive forms of taxation rather than actually using progressive forms of taxation to actually fund and finance what is an absolute national crisis. Councillor Nelson, sounds like you've been busy. Fantastic. It's great to hear members of the council sharing what you've been doing in your wards. You, know, you reference Friends of Lordy Park, and I've agreed with yourself to, to come and visit, I think, at the end of the week to, to look at the park and what the needs of the park are and how we can collaborate and work together to, to realise that. So thank you for, for highlighting that. Also, residents of Caroline Dixon Streets, children of Kings Road Estate, I think Lady Jane Hall you mentioned as well, in terms of all the great work that's going on in Caddishead and Ireland. So thank you for sharing that with us, because I think it's important we take time out sometimes in this council chamber to really celebrate our community, celebrate the real heroes of the city of Salford. And you'll be aware that that was one of the reasons or the driving forces behind why we now have a kind of biannual Spirit of Salford award ceremony. It's to celebrate the people who are doing great things within our communities. Also, thanks for highlighting all the sporting achievements, including Earlham Town and obviously Salford Reds, who, who we've already talked about, will be going into the playoffs. I think, you know, our sporting communities are really, really important. And only the other week, I found out that Walkden um, FC 
the, the, the young kind of football team over in Walton North, actually, um, had had their dugouts um, smashed and decimated. And I have to say, our development community in Salford came forward very quickly to try and find a solution. So developers in the city will be fully funding those replacements and, and building them for them, which is an absolute fantastic achievement. So we need to continue to support that. Councillor Fletcher, thanks for your kind comments on the Salford Big Day Out. I, it's certainly the biggest big day out I've been to um, since we've had big day out. Um, and you're absolutely right. There were an estimated 7,000 people attended. And obviously we had the cycling as well to accompany what we were doing on the lawns. But I felt for me the big day out was just a celebration of all the great stuff that's going on in the city of Salford. And it was great to see many councillors in attendance talking with our organisations and partners in the city and celebrating together some of the great stuff that's going on. Councillor Turner, thanks for drawing our attention to um, the fact that this is the month when Jeremy Corbyn was elected. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, found, I think what was interesting about what you had to say uh, is what, what was the alternative? And, and Labour's alternative, as far as I'm aware, is a fully costed alternative rather than, you know, a Tory alternative, which is just promising things without any detail and seemingly not being challenged by the press and the media to fully cost some of your pledges, which in and of itself is actually quite interesting. But at a time when we have an economy where Amazon are making profits of 75 million and only paying 1 million in taxation, and the chief executive of Persimmons is earning 35 million, which could employ over 1,500 employees on an average wage within the construction industry. Dare I say to you, Councillor Turner, that there is an alternative vision, a vision where we prioritise infrastructure, a vision where we prioritise some of our challenges around the green economy and the Paris Agreement, a vision that genuinely creates a green industrial revolution. And what's interesting about Labour's alternative is it's also supported by hundreds of leading economists around the world. And increasingly, it's supported by our own domestic business community. How interesting. Clearly, Labour does have an alternative. And Councillor Turner favours a Prime Minister that goes around the country promising the earth and delivering nothing. Councillor Merry, thank you for citing history about Boris Johnson's comments with regards to the St George's flags and how he got that wrong. It was in, in connection with taxis rather than the City Council and obviously you, you called him out. And also thanks for sharing um, your reflections on what you called an incoherent speech at the Convention of the North. And also, you highlighted how Jennifer Williams, a Manchester Evening News journalist, known for investigative, evidence-based, robust journalism, called him out around his spend on regenerating town centres. And as she rightly highlights, because she's done her homework, it is evidence-based. This is spent in marginal constituencies to shore up the Conservative vote. Dare I say that is not too cynical. That is where we find British politics in 21st century Britain. Highly politicised, lack of rationality and a lack of what's good for the country. And as you highlighted as well, it's an abuse of the Constitution. Lying to the monarchy. Is this really what British politics has become? We have to be better. Councillor Morris, thanks for sharing that no progress has been made on the green paper. We've already highlighted off the back of what Councillor Reynolds said that that is the case, unfortunately. We need to continue to keep the pressure on government to come forward as quick as possible with a solution to what is a national crisis in social care. Thank you also to Councillor Edwards for sharing with us our cricket achievements over recent times, again, building on what Councillor Lewis said in terms of our sporting achievements, predominantly in football and rugby. And also, thank you, Councillor Leitner, for, for your comments. I don't think they warrant a response from me, but thank you.
Thank you very much. If we've gone to item number 10, it's questions or comments placed to the different cabinet members as they execute their portfolios. Uh, we haven't received any uh, through the uh, post as requested, so happy to take any from the floor. Please indicate, I'll go through the different directorates one by one. The first one being Councillor Bosho, the Str uh, Strategy uh, Deputy Mayor of State of Salford. Okay. Councillor Mary, Deputy City Mayor. No questions? Councillor Hines. No questions? Um, Councillor Lancaster. No questions? This is going to be quick. Um, Councillor Antrobus. Councillor Sharp. Only a quick one. I'd just like to place on record uh, my thanks to both Councillor Antrobus and the City Mayor and to some of the dev developers in Salford um, for the support given to North Wharton. And I'd just like to ask, would support still be available in the future for uh, anything? <laughs> <laughs> For, for similar support schemes in the future. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Gina Reynolds. Councillor Warmishum. too well with the number of homeless charities and organisations that we've got. And one of the big issues for the homeless within our city is accessing medical assistance and medical help. And I was just wondering whether Councillor Reynolds could tell us what is on offer in the city for the people that are homeless that use these organisations. Thank you, Councillor Warmson. Well, my fellow uh, colleague. Um, yeah, I had the pleasure of visiting Loaf and Fishes, which you know is uh, off Churchill Way on Paddington Close and offers some marvellous facilities and support for our homeless population. Um, so I had the pleasure of visiting with Councillor Kelly, um, our lead on housing, and um, Andy Burnham to, to have a look round that facility and to meet some of the service users. Um, that was a couple of weeks ago. And they've actually introduced the Salford Homeless um, GP practice in there. There's Dr. Young, um, along with a practice nurse and a healthcare assistant. Um, people from the homeless community can go in there and register with that practice using Paddington Close as the address, which also enables them to get benefits and other support which is fantastic. Um, he's, he's an absolutely lovely gentleman, Dr. Young. It was a real pleasure to actually talk to him, to go up to the surgery and to have a look round at the facilities um, in, in that building. Um, also, he's, he's doing a mobile service where he goes out to the Narrowgate Shelter, um, also in my ward, and out to Emmaus. He also provides a service um, from the Salford Unemployment and Resource Centre in Eccles. Um, and the staff and volunteers in there, will, which will also support people to take them out to dental practice. Currently, the dental practice is in Ancoats in Manchester. I would like to see us using a practice in Salford. So we're going to do some work uh, around that. But currently, they can access dental services in Ancoats area. And also, um, the homeless community can go into any of our gateways and use facilities that our health improvement service provide and all the services that health improvement service provide in this city, they, they are able to, to access and use. Um, we're also trying to extend mental health provision more to the homeless population and there's currently some work being done on that. 
to make more of a mental health service offer um, to those people. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. You were quick for me. You've got no questions. Councillor Cannell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was really moved by the procession and vigil to remember people from Salford lost to suicide and to support those left behind, which was held outside Salford Museum and Art Gallery last Tuesday, 10th September, which was World Suicide Prevention Day. The event was organised by Starts, a fantastic organisation to help use creativity to help vulnerable people from all walks of life improve their skills and gain in confidence. The procession began at Starts Wellbeing Centre on Broad Street. We carried 126 yellow flags along the route, each one representing a life lost to suicide in Salford over the last five years. As part of the vigil, the list of people from Salford lost to suicide over the last five years was read out. <laughs> this includes Councillor Paul Longshaw, who unfortunately I never got to know. What I do know about him is he was a very talented, respected and loved member of this council chamber. Next month is World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October, and that is also focusing on suicide prevention. I've personally suffered with anxiety and depression. It was the main reason that I left my previous job. It took me a few years to accept my condition and learn how to manage my thoughts and feelings. I wasn't suicidal, but I did understand how someone could become so from the place I was at. One of the main things that helped me get on top of my mental health was speaking to other people who had been through similar or worse experiences than myself and that they had learned how to deal with it and get themselves back on track. I'm still on medication for anxiety and depression. I still use CBT techniques and mindfulness to help control my thoughts and my moods. I still have to focus on looking after myself. And I still speak to people who experience similar thoughts and feelings. We listen to each other and we help each other. Having been through this, I know how difficult it is to ask for help when you're struggling. I hope that me talking about my experience here might encourage someone who is feeling overwhelmed or feels like giving up to seek help, to speak to someone. The question I would like to ask is, what are we doing as a council to support the prevention of suicide in the city of Salford? And what are we doing to reach out to support employees of the council, including the elected members who might be struggling with their mental health? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kamal. Um, you've been very brave there to share your experiences, and I really thank you for that, um, for, for standing up and, and, and doing that here today, um, and to reach out and help other people um, who, who need help. So, so thank you. I'd like to pay tribute to that. Also, thank you for mentioning... Um, Councillor Longshaw, who we all very sadly miss and is still here in our hearts. Um, gosh, um, what are we doing? I, I, you've, you've referenced, first of all, Star, who are an absolutely fantastic mental health charity. And I'm pleased to say that the CCG is committed to further fund um, the work that they're doing um, on their Reach Out to End suicide campaign. So that is be, it, the funding for that is continuing and the work that they're doing will be continuing and long may it continue. What I'd just like to add is they're also doing a lot of support around employment. Um, they're doing a two-year pilot to deliver an employment, an em employment support course for people with secondary care mental health needs. Um, and, and that is something really worthwhile. So I'm pleased that that, that is being delivered by them. We've also, we've, on a wider scale, we've developed an, an all-age mental health strategy, which is the first time it's been all-age. That's been done collaboratively 
with a lot of partners and with people with the lived experience of mental health. Members of the Mental Health Forum, which are a group who meet monthly in the Pendleton Gateway, and everyone's welcome to, to join them and to see what they do and to con contribute um, to, to what they're doing. That meets on the first Wednesday of the month um, at the Gateway. Um, I think I have the time somewhere, but I can, I can email that out, the times of that um, group. There's also other service group, um, users groups in the city and they've been put it into lots of our strategies and the work we, we're currently doing. We have a suicide prevention partnership. Um, again, there's people on that with the lived experience as well as partners, ensuring that individuals don't feel that suicide is their only option. And we're trying to address with that the impact it, it has on families and communities identifying high-risk groups and working closer um, with, with our partners. There's an organisation called Six Degrees, which are a social enterprise, and they support those bereaved by suicide. Um, they're a lead group in, the, in GM. We also have our own bereavement group in the Earlham and Cadden's Head area, which a lot of you will be familiar with. And one of our um, former ceremonial mayors, Christine Hudson um, is very much one of the founders of that group, along with her sister. Um, also, Councillor Hamilton has done some counselling um, work with, with that group. There's a number of online, ca online campaigns. We have a Managing Thoughts of Suicide card, which I think was put in the pigeon holes by Councillor Hamilton, who has special responsibilities for mental health and has been leading recently on mental health. And Councillor um, Hamilton put into Members Pigeonholes a hard copy of the new newsletter, which he's going to do on a quarterly basis for members, which signposts people um, for advice, support and help that they can get, and also highlights some of the work that, that's currently being done. Um, one of the things which I'm really proud of is the living well, well model that we're, we're currently developing. This has come from Lambeth, who are on a seven-year journey to develop their living well model. We're doing it, obviously, differently in Salford because it's not a one-size-fits-all. It has to be relevant to, to our population and our needs. So it's a hub-and-spoke model delivered by primary care and secondary care in the voluntary sector. And again, we've got a lot of um, service users and people involved in the mental health forum who are helping to mould and shape that. There's going to be a living well hub that will be established, and it's for people, it's, it's for anyone who needs help experience a mental health problem to openly access that, to help them recover and to stay well. So it'll be combining social and clinical support um, they've been working with the innovation unit and they've got 300,000k to start that off from the big lottery. Um, so as I say, it's been designed by people with that lived experience. Um, we're also developing home-based treatment services more. Our adult mental health crisis service and our li health, uh, mental health liaison service um, is very well recognised um, throughout GM, and that's helping people who present at A&E. Um, we're achieving national targets with that and over and above, and our early intervention in psychosis is currently achieving national targets. We're also developing a perinatal mental health service because we recognise that a lot of women who have given birth do suffer from mental health um, so there's a programme, not only at a local level, but a GM level, um, using a community psychiatric unit, and we're hoping to provide services in our midwife-led unit locally. We're also on a journey with our emotional-friendly accredited schools. Um, a lot of our staff now in schools are trained mental health first aiders, um, and we're giving further training to people who currently haven't had that training. Um, we get, we're doing more mental health support in residential homes for our older population. 
just to talk about what we're doing as a council for our employees. We have a health and wellbeing steering group that not only looks at the physical health, but the mental health of our workforce. And that's currently chaired by Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Hamilton sits on that group. And I have previously sat on that group. They're ensuring that all our managers are trained to recognise mental health issues with our workforce. There's an offer of mental health and suicide awareness training. Again, I think in the news, the um, newsletter that Councillor Hamilton sent out to all um, our elected members, um, that signposted people to how they can get that training. And um, as I say, we've also, when Councillor Sharp was my deputy, he um, organised a cross-party working group looking at the mental health of elected members. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. That was a very good and thorough answer to your question. Now, people will know there's other uh, late members or deputy mayors uh, who are not here at this meeting. Can I just remind people that uh, the city mayor and the cabinet um, are very happy to meet and discuss uh, any problems people would have between council meetings. If we go then to the next gender item is to ask questions or make comments to the chairs of the different scrutiny committees. Any questions of Councillor Jolly, who is chair of overview scrutiny? Councillor Saunders. Councillor Brocklehurst, he is chair of the Children's Scrutiny Panel. Councillor Birch, Communities and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel. Councillor Saunders. Councillor Morris, uh, Chair of Health and Social Care Scrutiny Panel. Nope, Councillor Kate Lewis, she's not here today. Councillor Saunders, if you want to ask a question, we will get a response between meetings. You're perfectly, perfectly right. Could you ask your question, please? Um, can I um, ask Councillor Sharp, and appreciate he's only just taken over, um, on the 14th of August, the City Mayor issued um, one of his... Um, uh, as, as he's entitled to do, a, um, uh, he published what, uh, an edict, as it were, um, bringing in landlord, selected landlord licensing for the Weast and Seedley area. This was, this was published on the 14th of August. You can see this. We all got copies. On the, uh, this was subject to a call-in period, which ended on the 21st of August, it also said that it, they expect a possible legal challenge, but that's, that, that doesn't concern me. On the 15th of August, the very next day, um, the Manchester Weekly News published an advertisement by the council um, saying that this had been published. It didn't mention it was subject to call in uh, and saying that this had now been adopted. Uh, in fact, because the news comes out slightly earlier than the publishing date, it was actually out on the day, even before the, uh, the, 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 the item had been published. And I just wonder if Councillor Sharp feels that this is a discourtesy at the very least to his committee. Because 
it's Councillor Saunders. We don't think Councillor Shaft is going to be in a position where he can answer your question. And there might be a question you might want to ask the different officers in the council. So we, we'll follow. If we then move on to asking questions or making comments to anybody serving an outside committee, any questions or comments? No? Item number 13, the scheduled reports. We each got the reports. These reports are basically for information and the invitation is any points that are raised from them can be directed directly to uh, the different persons with responsibility. You've got a list on your minutes. Uh, I've not been told of any matters of any other business, so declare this council meeting closed. <laughs>